I'm Miwa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over and Alexander Hemon, MacArthur Genius Grant recipient, screenwriter, novelist, essayist, memoirist, short story writer. I mean, that's how I first encountered you with the question of Bruno. I think I'm missing something. Dad, mm -hmm. son, brother, <laughs> music, <laughs> professor. Music, music, oh, right. The music. That's good God. I was just talking about that before we started recording. But yes, the music, CeeLo Hemon. But we will talk about all of this. But I am going to warn listeners, too. I can't call you Alexander. I have to call you Sasha because I've never known you by any other name. And I just, Alexander, I know it's your byline. It's a great byline. But Sasha, I can't do it. So, hi. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. Hi, Miwa. So the world and all it holds. I mean, we're taping this, obviously, in advance of its publication. But the world and all it holds is your new book. It's your first novel in a while, right? Um, uh, since 2015. Yeah, right. The, zomb the zombie wars. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to set this up because I don't want to give anything away. We're really going to stick to a spoiler free conversation here. But if I start talking about this book the way I want to talk about this book, I'm going to give some stuff up, <laughs> which is not good. So, Sasha, will you set this up? Well, it starts, the book starts in 1914 in Sarajevo, Bosnia, my hometown on the day the Archduke Franz Ferdinand uh, was assassinated with his wife, which set off World War I. So the main character is Rafael Pinto, who's a, a Serb and Bosnian um, separat, a Jew of the people who were expelled from the Iberian Peninsula in the 15th century, which who were welcome to the Ottoman Empire, generally speaking, and Bosnia was part of it. In any case, on June 28, 1914, he is just Minding his own business at his pharmacy and manages to witness their assassination. After that, he's recruited to fight in the Bosnian troops in World War I and is in Galicia, today's Western Ukraine, Ukraine, a big front, where the Austrian Grand Empire was defeated soundly in the so-called Brusilov Offensive. And then um, the prisoners of war were sent to uh, today's Uzbekistan. Back then it was Turkestan, the general uh, Russia colonial province where he is in a, a POW camp in the trenches or in the army when he's um, before, before he's sent to Galicia and then in Galicia, he falls in love with a fellow soldier, Osman, who's of Muslim background. Two of them are now in Tashkent, and they're there also when the um, Bolshevik revolution starts, where you know, the, the prisoners are released, but they had no way of getting back home. So they tried to get out of the situation, and then instead of going west, so Bosnia would be west to, in relation to Tashkent, they go east for some reason, which I will not give up. And then um, uh, Raphael um, and uh, a little girl who he deems to be his daughter, they end up in Shanghai. The last three chapters are in Shanghai, and then there's an epilogue after that, which is relatively contemporary. The characters of the in the novel they go from Sarajevo to Shanghai in over uh, in about thirty five years, and so that is the setup. You've written a love story that's also a war story, that's a spy story, that's also a story of displacement and refugees. You do a lot in three hundred ish pages. Hundred and two thousand words. Yeah. A lot of other writers would, you know, take this as an opportunity to do 600 pages and make a giant, giant thing. But one of the things I've always appreciated about you is that you have these sentences and you just write, you grab these little details and you can do in a sentence what some other folks might take a little bit longer to do. When did you start working on the world? Well, I don't know, but I signed a contract on proposal in 2010 with my British publisher and was clearing my schedule when, when my young daughter got ill and died, and then I was thrown off. And so I was working on the book on and off since then. And in the meantime, I published four other books and wrote scripts and moved to Princeton and did a large number of other things. It's at least 12 years old, probably more. And probably certainly more, but I don't know. I cannot locate in time the moment of conception. It was one chapter at a time. The way the book is organized, it's always placed in a particular place at a particular time. And so I was moving through those places and those times one at a time. And before each chapter, I would do the research for the place and time. 
oh, the first chapter is in Sarajevo in, in 1914, the second chapter is in Galicia, and the, the, you know, the trenches of, the, of Galicia in 1916. So after I wrote the first chapter, then I would do research about trench warfare in Galicia in 1916 and the Bosnian troops and, and all that. And then I would write that chapter. And then next thing it was prisoners of war camps in Central Asia, and then I would read all that and so on. So um, in some ways, it took a long time, but also it was necessary. Could have done it faster. But I, I do not suffer from writer's block if I have a problem, is that I write too much too often. So it's, I'm fine with the, the length of time that I spent writing this book. I don't know if I'd consider it too much too often a problem when I'm reading you, but okay. I mean, if you want to, if that's how you're going to put it, but I don't find that a problem for me. I'm just now thinking, though, I mean, if this book, you signed the contract 12 years ago, it sort of changes the way I think about this book already. And <laughs> thinking about this script that I read, my notes that I have written out, and it's just, well, it's thrown me off just a tiny bit because here I am thinking that this is the absolute evolution of all of the work you've been doing. And yes, in the meantime, you did write the zombie novel and you had two collections of nonfiction. And then we get here and I'm just, I'm trying to connect the dots because you never really wanted to write nonfiction. You were sort of poked in the direction of that by a lot of different folks. The thing is, I don't write a think linearly, which is why I get distracted often and, and, and have learned over the years to learn as four or five things simultaneously. Um, writing and never mind all the other projects like music or film or whatever and so it is I guess, it's an advantage of being a dilettante and a scatterbrain that in fact <laughs> I found a system that I can do all this and so you know people will ask me so this fo book follows that book how is that an evolution whereas the fact is I was effectively writing all of those books at the same time I'm gonna have to change my approach a tiny bit because I think I didn't realize what was happening all at once. I thought the music and the screenwriting and the writing of books were the multiple projects, but now the way you describe it, I'm just like, oh, wait. <laughs> My entire life is, a, is multiple projects happening simultaneously, synchronously, as it were, which is how I do things. It's fine. But in any case, which allowed for me to sort of not just to evolve the book, but, you know, react to things in some convoluted ways. In other words, I would write things stimulated by things that were happening in my life and around it. But also, another thing that, and I did this with Lazarus Project and Love and Obstacles, two books that I also was writing at the same time. That meant that I didn't have to put everything in one book. Yeah, Love and Obstacles is absolutely, and until the world and all that it holds came out, Love and Obstacles was actually my favorite of your books. And I'm very fond of Question of Bruno, but I thought Bruno and Nowhere Man also sort of had that connection because of Joseph Pronick. Right. Well, yeah, in, in the first book, The Question of Bruno, there's a the longest story features Pronick, and the second book is all about Joseph Pronick. Yeah. But were you working on those at the same time, too? No, I don't think so. But I was, I mean, working, depends how you define working. I wasn't typing text for two books at the same time, as I was with these four books that I just mentioned, or five at some point. But rather, I was thinking about things, you know, you, you're finishing one story, there's something in the back of your brain sort of nagging and, you know, burrowing itself and developing and growing and all that. I don't know if I'll do it. I always keep it as a possibility that I will not write another book but probably will. And so that there are, there are books that I have been, you know, gestating in my head for quite a while now. And so then someone will ask me some years now, you know, how long have you been working on it? And I don't know. Because what was a half-assed idea, you know, generated while I was walking with a dog and I just put it aside and slowly it becomes something that does not go away. And then and then you write a little bit about it, then you look into it, you read a book, and you think, ah, I don't, I don't I want to produce music, or I just want to watch the World Cup. But then the thing keeps growing. And so there's this whole production model in which you sort of have the idea, you sort of sit down and you write a certain number of pages over a certain amount of time, and you crank it out, you turn it in, you tour, and then you start a new one. I guess that's how musicians do albums. Right but that's not how I do it. At, at any given time, there's a there's a choir of ideas and nagging voices in my head, the chatter that I, that I have to contend with. 
and I guess in the end, it ends up with this um, model of working and living, which in which everything is happening simultaneously. <laughs> on the same <laughs> Do you sleep? Very little. No. Yeah. But at least it's enough. Yeah, but I okay. cannot get. I, in the morning when I wake up, I'm like a spring. I do not linger in bed unless I'm sick. I cannot wait to get up and do stuff because I'm always behind. Okay, but wait, you're teaching full time. Right. You're also doing the screenwriting on the side, I guess. I mean, do we call that on the side? Like, it's not, Well, I mean, it's not on the side when I'm in the project. It's, I'm a professional, and so it's not on the side. The people who I work with and for four, they expect me to be fully committed and present. It's not a hobby. I don't do hobbies. Really. Everything I do, I do as though it's the only job I'm doing. Which brings me to the music, Silo Hemon. Because <laughs> I was listening to you. <laughs> there was a lot happening. Uh, as I was prepping for this, but the music, how do we fit the music in to what you're doing? And how do we describe it? I mean, it's it's kind of ambient dance music. It's electronica. It's electronica, yes. Um, I, well, I happen to be writing a book about it, about this whole musical project, because it started in the pandemic when I had this intense urge to make stuff to begin with, and then at some point to make music, which started with just my playing the guitar. Within a week of the pandemic, not being declared, but uh, within a week of Princeton University dismissing the students, I bought an electric guitar and an amp and some pedals, because I thought it was going to last for a long time and I'm going to go nuts. And also I can return to playing the guitar. I had played it. I had a band back in the day, but I would occasionally play Beatles songs for my kids. And so I started, you know, tormenting the guitar in the bedroom. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I can record some of this torment. And so, so I started figuring out how to record. And then, you know, little by little, I learned to use Logic, the um, music production software. The best thing about it is that I found people to work with. So I started collaborating with a friend of mine. One of my oldest friends I've known since first grade, who lives in California, was a phenomenal guitar player. We used to have a band together and talked and thought about it the whole time. And we had, we had been in touch over the years, but, you know, just checking in. And once I contacted him and, you know, said, yeah, I'm doing this, come along. And mm -hmm. he was in. Now it's, it's a, the, the friendship was dormant, as it were. It's fully blooming. And we talk and discuss and plan music stuff and expand and it's very exciting. But I, I it's a very, the very, I mean, I hope that music it gets very popular, makes a lot of money. But I, I'm only rewarded because I started connecting with people. I, then we connected. He got on my friend guitar player and I with a guy in Sarajevo who used to play in a band that once opened for us when we were very young. And then he mixes the stuff, and then we. Then I started producing videos and, and recruiting various Bosnian visual artists. Some of them I knew, some of them I became friends with because I recruited them. And suddenly this whole operation is growing and it all comes out of this need that I think all art fulfills, or at least can fulfill, is of connecting people over time and space. And, and in the excitement of making things together is not that easily available in literature and writing. I spent 12 years, you know, with four books in my head. And there's a thing that depends entirely on regular communication, exchange of ideas, and someone else's knowledge of things that I don't know well. And it, it, it's become this collective endeavor. In that sense, it's very similar to screenwriting because I've written solo scripts that have not been produced, but the best screenwriting experiences I've had were with other people. The same model, except we're not in the room, is in the music. All these people I like together. And it's very great. That visual component, too, to your music brings me back to the world. There are photographs in this book the way there are in Lazarus Project or even early on in Bruno where there are photos and whatnot. Because I do sort of think of that as something that you like to do is drop in that visual, even though you trust your readers to a certain extent. The idea of you dropping in visuals. And I was a little surprised to have them here. I just, I wasn't expecting that at all. Well, they're not that many. They're only two pictures of two men. I know, who might, or might I not know. Be. but About still. It's just 
suggestive. <laughs> I know, I know, but that sort of reliance on a visual when really you're a words guy. Now you're a music guy too, but you're a words guy. And I just, I want to talk about that and that connect. Is that a way for you to bring more people in? I like looking for forms, new forms for my old ideas, as it were, right? I don't think, I don't necessarily think that my book's extremely original, but I, I do think this is how I teach, writing when I teach, is I don't think that the form for the book I want to write exists before I write the book. So the very process of writing is a search for form. And so in that sense, it's, it's very difficult because I don't know what I'm doing until I'm done. But also it gives a great feeling of discovery and, and flexibility. Let's see what happens if I do this. And I did that in The Question of Bruno and a, and a number of other books. When I wrote The Lazarus Project, the very idea started with a picture of Lazarus in bed in a chair being shown by a white policeman. And I thought, I need that. I need to write about this. But with this book, um, I just came across the pictures of these two men. And I felt I recognized them. Not quite. I mean, my characters are not based on any real personalities. But there was something about them. When I saw the pictures, I thought, those are the men. And I will not tell you where the pictures are. So I have to, if they're not obvious. I, and the other thing is, you were talking about maps. I really talked to my editor, Sean, and the designer, he and we work with very often, Rodrigo Corral, who's a bit And so I, I, I said, I want maps. And uh, it's the world. We, I want some maps, but not simply re representational maps, but maps as part of the makeup of this world, because they cross great distances over time. I wanted the reader to have a sense when they're reading a book, they're in the world. And the world that might or might not exist still, but it's not, they're not, you know, in suburban Chicago or France or whatever, they're in the world. And so I realized it's only after, after I've written the book. So it starts in 1914, ends in 1949. At no point are they in any kind of a situation uh, or a territorial organization that we would call nation state or functioning state of any kind. They move through history that is in countries and empires that are coming apart. And so it, it, it um, presents them with a different experience of identity and being in the world and being in, in, a, in a country or a place. Statelessness, I mean, you can sit and sit with statelessness in two ways. I mean, either your Pinto, who's always, he's clear that he's from Sarajevo and Sarajevo is home and that's the core of him. But in order to get back, he's got to take this rather circuitous route. And so this statelessness is not necessarily something that impacts him until it does. You know, it's either there or it's not. It isn't one of these sort of things that he walks around thinking about. Like he's not looking for his passport until he actually needs papers. Well, he never quite gets the passport. One of the reasons he and people, I, well, I don't know that's the reason they went, but a lot of people end up in Shanghai in the 30s because you didn't need a passport to get to Shanghai, but you need a passport to get out. That was a different proposition. And so getting out was the problem. I mean, the statelands was a, a, a feature of history at that point when the, in the spring of 1914, and let that be a lesson to us today, in the spring of 1914, the world much of the world was part of four major empires, maybe five if you count German imperial ambition as sustainable, which turned out it wasn't, but let's say four, right? And not only were the empires that governed much of the world's territory, but also they had lasted for centuries and was rooted in the, the divine right of kings to rule, right? Entirely different social organization, right? Not just Territorial organization, social organization with the emperor at the, at the top or the queen or whatever. Five years later, three of them were irreversibly gone. The fourth one, the British Empire, is ending in forest these days in total, as a total joke with Boris Johnson, the last emperor. And so <laughs> the clowns have finally won. The solution of these empires, historically and you know, politically, resulted in all these little nation states that would be the conquered by the Soviet Union or the Nazis at some point. It was an entirely different type of mess, if you wish. 
But when Pinto, both, both Osman and Pinto at the beginning of the book are the subjects of the Austro-Hungarian Emperor Franz Josef. So they had no state as such. They had no state in which their identities were confirmed by the organization of the state. So they, when they leave that, they're as free and as uncared for as anyone in the world. And there's this, I mean, I didn't start with this demand on my uh, characters to be stateless. I wanted my characters to live in that period. And then that period resulted in a lot of stateless people. 20th century is a century of statelessness. Only toward the end, there was some kind of stabilization. or well, not toward the end, the mid-century, there was some stabilization in Europe, but not anywhere else. All the 20th century is migration. Yeah, but displacement has always been a part of your work, whether it's stories or the longer novels. I mean, certainly starting with your own story, you end up in Chicago in 92, the Bosnian War starts to happen and you can't go home. English is in fact your second language. And I don't know if every listener would know that given how you write and how you speak. I mean, well, a listener might, but well, all right. Yeah, there's a little bit of an accent, but you know, also as a, so I'm first gen on one side and old gen on the other side. And I don't, I don't know. Accents are just, I don't know if I take them for granted or they're just part of the universe, whatever. I don't think about that. You've been compared to Nabokov, though. You've been compared to Joseph Conrad. You actually make jokes about Joseph Conrad and Bruno and the Pranic story in Bruno, which still makes me laugh because you're one of the few people I know who can joke about Conrad and get away with it because it works. But here's the thing. I mean, do we ever truly find home? I mean, aren't we all displaced in a way? I mean, we've got a million different people claiming to be American and saying other people can't be American. And I'm just using this as the example because you and I are both Americans. But at the same time, I leave the country and there are places where I'm very comfortable. And then there are other places where I'm like, yeah, I could go home now. This would be great. I mean, well, yeah, there's a difference between feeling this place and actually being displaced. And so out of your home space, that has psychological consequences, but also has very concrete uh, legal and, and then political consequences. So people who are, you know, the migrants who are drowning in the Mediterranean, to them, it's not a metaphysical question or a philosophical question or identity question. They're displaced because they're floating on a boat. They'll make it, and when they get across, if they get across to France or the UK or whatever, they will still be displaced because there'll be people hunting them to return them to the place of no place where they came from. They don't care where they're going to go. And the Mexican border in the United States, right? They're not, I mean, I know what you're saying, and there's this sort of disorientation that we experience at this time mm -hmm. in, in this country. But it's we don't have the logistical problems of survival as most of those people do, which you know could result in any number of stories or genres of stories that people would be telling to each other before they even read it, if they ever read it, if they ever had access to what I have now as a you know an American of 30 years. I can simply sit down and write a book and someone will publish. So, but it, what you bring up is interesting, the, the notion of home, where is it? Is it a concept or is it a place? It's a concept, is it portable? That is, can you take it from you know here to Shanghai and be at home? Or and if it's a place, could you only feel at home in one place? Now, you know, the whole notion of nostalgia comes from the Greek word nostos which means returning home. The harder it is to return home, the greater nostalgia is. So it's a contingent upon our concept of home, but also a place to which we cannot re return, as it were. And so what interests me, because it's partly my experience, but also because it's not that people who are migrating have no voices, they're just busy migrating, right? Once they settle, they might, like I did, and many other people in American literature at least, who have come from elsewhere, once they settle, then they'll have voices, some of them. But there's a whole population in the world, they're too busy just staying alive. And one day they'll perhaps tell those stories. And so I've been thinking about this, as you correctly pointed out, from the very beginning, that displacement is the condition of my life. Even if I'm in Princeton and I'm doing very well, but the sense, and so there's a place that is home in the United States, because my family and kids are there, and there's a place that is home in Sarajevo. But conceptually, there is a, well, there's nostos, there's a way, there's a, a this desire this, that cannot be fulfilled to return to this conceptual original home where things were okay. 
although might not have ever existed really, but where do you go where things were okay? And one of the things I wanted to give to Pinto is this his remembrance, partly of Sarajevo, but also of his mother's kitchen or his parents' house or the, you know, the mornings in bed. Um, so that it's, it is very specific, right? It's very specific. So I do long for a conceptual home, but I do have specific places that could fulfill that need to some extent. But there are people who do not have it conceptually or practically or actually. Nostalgia is also something we can manipulate. It's easily manipulated. And in some cases, Pinto and the rest of the characters, they are that sense of home and that desire to get home that does get manipulated. They are in dangerous situations as a result. And I do want to bring up, there's a British major who is a wonderful piece of comic relief, but I love this idea. And, and certainly, you know, it's something that a lot of writers recently have toyed with. I mean, Lauren Wilkerson has toyed with this in American Spy, yet Tom Nguyen certainly um, with the committed and the sympathizer. But this idea of spy story as metaphor, bad behavior that isn't political. I mean, can we just talk about why Major had to be part of this story? I mean, he really had to be part of the story. And he is a good character and he does some wild things. Well, um, I've always loved spies, and there are spies in my first book, uh, Question of Bruin, and the second book. And then on some ways later books, at least in the zombies wars. But it really, the idea for the book started because I was reading, I read history books randomly, but a, a memoir by Colonel Frederick Bailey is a British spy in the 20s and um, Major Moser Ethring, um, the character referred to, he, he's kind of based on him and I, I changed a lot of things. Frederick Mad Hedder Bailey is quite a fascinating character, but in his memoir, um, mission in Tashkent, it's called. There's a mention of a guy in Tashkent who worked for the Cheka, the Bolshevik Secret Service, who was from Sarajevo. Colonel Bailey was very good at spying, so they couldn't catch him. At some point, the Sarajevo spotted him and said, I know who you are, you're a spy, but I also do not really care about any of this. I want to go back to Sarajevo, so let's work together. And then the Sarajevo, he hired um, Bailey was under, you know, pretending to be Romanian or something, to work for the Cheka. And while well, they were looking for him. So he would go to the offices <laughs> to look for him. And then the Sarajevo had a brilliant idea that how to get out of Tashkent, because down the road was Bukhara, which was ruled by Emir very brutally, but right. it was not controlled by the Bolsheviks. And so he spread the rumors, the Sarajevo and Bailey, they spread the rumors that Bailey was in in Bukhara, and then the Sarajevan volunteered to go to Bukhara and kill Bailey. And then he decided, they said, great idea, go. And he took Bailey with him, right, under the false pretense that they were going to kill the guy. And this is how they escaped Tashkent. And I thought, I love this. This is this is right up my alley. And this the whole, and I know how many years ago I read that book, I mean, 15 at least. The whole thing started growing from this, this character and he vanishes then from the book and from history. I could not track him down. Once they get out of Tashkent, I, with this guy who doesn't care about any of this, you know, revolutions or the great game, the com, you know, the um, competition between the Russian and British empires. All he wants is to get back home, and he's very good at it. I, I would think he made it home. However, in in the in the in history, they went to Persia and escaped. That's one of the reasons Bailey. Escape and with the with the Sarajevo, escape to Persia. There was the then called Persia, today's Iran, was my people. They go east, further east. Yeah, I liked that running east. It's been so long since Shanghai has sort of made an appearance, and it was such a weird place anyway. The idea that this Chinese city was run by the Brits and the Americans and the French, and there were all of these white Russians running around. It was such a bizarre place and so of a moment and of a time it fits perfectly you did need a passport to be there so there's a large number of refugees including the white russians after the revolution and not just in shanghai but in the northern city of harbin it's still the architecture is predominantly russian 
and then in World War II or the, uh, and um, the 30s, and then in, in World War II, where the Holocaust began, because it didn't need a, a passport, there was a relatively large number of Jews, European Jews, who ended up there. And the Japanese, while they were, you know, put them in a ghetto, they did not exterminate them. And the Nazis kept sending their officers to talk them into extermination, but for some reason, it's a different story, they did not do it. So there was this whole, there was this transient population in some ways, but also people who were perpetually stuck in Shanghai, who would live there because they couldn't go anywhere else. And so in some ways, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, a, a refugee city par excellence. Even the people, Chinese people in Shanghai were effectively depending what side of the river they were, the Chinese part, the English part, the uh, international settlement, they were effectively refugees in their own city. And so it was the, the crime, the prostitution, the, the, the wealth, and, and incredibly wealthy people. Some of the wealthiest people in the world were in Shanghai. Uh, at the time, you know, the Hollywood stars would go to a hotel, the hotel in Shanghai in the 30s, the Cathay Hotel, was the one among the first in the world that had air conditioning. So, you know, um, Hollywood stars would go there and just sit in a hotel in an air conditioned space and take pictures in exotic places. <laughs> Opium was everywhere. Great for storytelling. It's not, you know, it's not, not a good place to raise kids, though. You know, again, that sense of belonging, I mean, the fact that Pinto is always moving forward, but he's moving forward to something that is in his past. I mean, Sarajevo really for him, he's been gone for almost 40 years. Right. He leaves in 1914 and the book ends in 1949. So yeah, it's, he's not moving forward. He's moving further, if you wish, or farther rather. Um, and so farther away from Sarajevo while trying to get back there. And it's, you know, it's, it is not unrelated to what we were talking about, you know, home and where is it and conceptual. The more conceptual home is, the harder it is to return to, if you wish. It's relatively easy to return to a place, but if your home is conceptualized as this thing in the past that could never be returned to, then you can just keep going and it's harder and harder. Yeah, I will say you have created a heartbreaker of a book without a doubt in the world. But you also have a buddy who's written not quite a soundtrack per se, but it's coming out a little later in the spring. It's an album coming out on Smithsonian Folkways and you sent me a preview of it and it's amazing. <laughs> it's I cannot wait for this to come out. But will you talk about that a little bit? Because I do, I love the idea that part of this becomes music, part of this becomes music that draws on Bosnian tradition and really sounds amazingly fresh and alive and smart and interesting. And I don't dance, so I can't say you can dance to it, but it's really great. And I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of that in this conversation. Osman and Pinto, the lovers, they sing to each other. And uh, um, uh, Pinto sings Sephardic songs. Um, they were carried over from Spain, um, and which I love. And, and there's a Great album. There was a great singer, Flori Yangoda, who left Sarajevo in 1947, a Jewish Sephardic woman, survived the Holocaust, ended up in Baltimore. And then later in her life, she was talked into recording an album with songs that her grandmother sang to her from Sarajevo. I love the songs. She recorded my two or three albums. She died last year, I think, at the age of 95 or so. But there are these traditional Sephardic songs, but also specifically Sarajevo songs. I wanted Pinto to sing that, and he sings that to Osman. Osman sings traditional Bosnian songs that come from Islamic tradition. A kind of music is called Sevdah. So I have a very good friend, Damir Imamovic, who's a, one of the um, great um, Bosnian Sevdah singers. He also comes from a dynasty of singers. His grandfather is a legendary divinity of Sevdah. His father was also singing. And I contacted him as writing the book sometime early in the pandemic and said, how about you record an album that features some of these songs and, and that I already used? And then we started working on that. And then he discovered some songs that I then integrated into the book after the fact, as it were. And then he wrote some songs that pertain to the book. So there's a song called Osman. It's about Osman, the love for Osman. It's fantastic. And so I talked him into this and he, he loved the idea. 
he's an icon of LGBT plus population in Sterling Bosnia because he's not in the closet. And he can formulate his position in that context in a way that is encouraging to people. All of his other albums are fantastic. And the Smithsonian Folkways, they had wanted to work with him for a while, and he pitched this thing to them, and they you know, embraced it instantly. So um, the album is recorded, it's in master, and everything is in its place. It's just this lag of release that you know, we know in publishing, too. Yeah, exactly. Well, we'll get details and we'll drop them in the show notes and all of that. But I did want us to have a chance to talk about it because, like I said, Ed, my head kind of exploded a little bit. And to sit with that in contrast with the music that you're making as CeeLo Hammond was a lot. <laughs> all good, but it was a lot. And I sort of feel like all of that comes rushing through the world because, I mean, as much as you and I have been talking about displacement and spy stories and war stories and this, you know, constant movement somewhere ultimately you've written a love story and i am burying that lead intentionally because i mean once you're in the book everything else is just a piece of that yeah and i really want people to be able to understand sort of where you're seated with all of this just because i know your body of work i mean i have read everything i think i may have even read something about soccer <laughs> Which I, you're a committed. I, I'm not gonna listen. Basketball's my game, but I read you on soccer. <laughs> I'm sure there's some, you know, some one-off pieces that I've read. There's but a lot of stuff. I'm telling you, I'm writing too much. But so I don't, I you know, I don't think you're writing too much. But I'm the soccer stuff is just not necessarily for me. I'm just tossing out there to the world that yeah, you do a lot, but the world to me, this new novel sits so firmly in the work that you've been doing. But, you know, this idea that love makes us who we are or love holds us close to home or love gets us through to the next piece, that's always there as much as you're talking about the other stuff. I mean, Sasha, I think you're kind of a romantic a little <laughs> I, bit, I, maybe? I, I guess, I, guess I, I, owe, I should own up to it in this instance. In the original, in the proposal that I was mentioning um, the, that I wrote to sell the book to my British publisher, they were friends. And I don't know when and how um, did I realize that they should be lovers. Uh, and I can't quite re remember the, the, the reasoning behind it. I think most likely it just became self-evident to me at some point because it would make everything more interesting. And also it would, uh, it would push me toward this romantic position, but it would, it would, it would make me love them more. Because to me, the crucial point in writing any book on the characters is when I start loving my characters. And, and when they're not simply created by me, but at least I have a kind of delusion that they have agency and sovereignty. And then uh, the best part of writing um, process is I can't wait to get up in the morning to be with them and then talk them along. And then my heart gets broken too sometimes. At some point early, but I can't remember when, Love became the crux of it all. And I was not a romantic. I think my initial interest was narrative more than sort of propaganda for love. <laughs> Sasha, I called you a romantic. I didn't tell you you were a propagandist for love. No, propaganda. <laughs> Horrible stuff. Yeah, we know that. But that's not what I'm saying you were doing. <laughs> no, I'm not saying you were saying that. What I'm saying is that it is, the difference was not, narratively interesting, they love each other, but it also, once I started writing it, I love them more for their love, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It, it feels much truer to who they both are as characters, and I was certainly invested in a different way. I mean, it's one thing to have friends sort of, you know, gallivanting through and doing whatever they need to do, and then it would have been much more of a buddy story. Yeah. And, and because it's you, there would have been moments of comedy, and I'm not sure I would have been as invested in the story without having the stakes be as high as they were. And they just, they felt so impossible in parts. And I was like, hmm, hmm. And there are a couple of things you do that you and I are not gonna talk about in this conversation, but at some point we will, <laughs> that are really clever and smart and unexpected. Um, and I did have moments where I was like, oh, I can still be surprised. I can still be surprised in a story like this. And it was really, um, 
it was charming and it was smart and it was exciting. And I was really mad when the book was over. I was so mad when I got to the end of the book. There are two sort of endings to this book. There's the actual ending of the primary story. And then you put on this epilogue. And I was mad when the, the first piece ended. And I was mad when the epilogue ended. <laughs> I was just so mad to be taken out of this world. Before I let you go, can we just quickly talk about the editing of a book like this, though? Because you've said you were writing and researching, writing and researching, writing and researching as we moved through the story. But, you know, again, there is some collaboration when you're publishing books. I mean, you do hand the book off eventually to your editor. You do eventually hand it off to the team that puts it out in the world and what have you. But at the same time... Are you editing as you go, or are you just doing a massive edit before you hand it over to people who aren't you? Well, I mean, people have different methodologies. I've, I've had the same editor, American editor, mm -hmm. in my entire writing life, Sean McDonald. And so, and um, as you know, well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but when he does, it's all gold. And so, yeah. whatever, whatever he says, I take into account and very seriously and often act upon his suggestions, and I don't mean to sound arrogant. I also know what I'm doing, and I know when it's done, and yeah. I know what I want, and, and and I figure out over time how to accomplish that. Right. So uh, I love working with Sean because I can formulate to him what th why things are as they are, which also means that in his few words, he can also formulate to me why he thinks something else should be a better idea. And so... But there was never in my life for 20 years of writing and working with Sean, there was never a major rewrite. Sometimes, you know, one or two books, there were some sort of structural changes, shifting the order of chapters or stories. I can't remember now. But nothing dramatic, traumatic, or even stressful with all that. We're part of this collaborative process. He's the, he's, as an editor, which means the first reader, really, and the most attentive reader of all the readers mm -hmm. ever going to read the book. And so that is, that you know, that I love working with an editor. I never think, certainly not with Sean, there's some kind of violation of my concept of genius if someone says, well, you know, what about this? And I, and that, in fact, pointing at things that need addressing is, a, is a, you know, it's the stamp that they're reading this seriously. They want things to, to be in, um, in full force, as it were. Hey, what's next? Are you working on a screenplay now? Or are you working on four books at once? What, what's going on? I'm working on my music, okay. but also there are other writing projects, including a book that I'm writing about making music. And then I owe a book or two, or one book, um, I have contract uh, that I have to finish. Mm -hmm. and there are these other ideas. But part of the process of getting to the next book is considering retirement. <laughs> what? That, no, I mean, it's part of the process, whatever happens. Is yeah. that, do I want to go through all this again, 12 years? A year and a half of preparation, you know, whereas I can do the all these other things that I haven't done before. Right. And so it is it's always been part of my process that I go through talking myself out of writing the, uh, the idea that I have, right? And if when I can't talk myself out of it anymore, then I start writing. No one's waiting for the next book to drop. If we stop writing, all of us right now, we're good for at least 100 years with books published. And so no one's going to notice, whoa, where, where is Hemon's last book? Where is Hemon's next book? No one's going to ask. Maybe people in the business, but outside of it, that wound would just close. And so it has to be, it has to feel necessary. You know, and so this is why I talk myself out of it until I can't, at which point it feels necessary and inescapable. And then I can. Yeah, the bookseller over here is like, okay, but 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 Sasha, no, <laughs> just keep writing, please. <laughs> I get it, I get it. We will always have writers, but you know what? I got to go back and spend a lot of time with your really early books as I was prepping for this because I was looking for the through line between the early stuff when I first met you a million years ago because of Sean and Bruno and then Joseph Pronick. And then Lazarus Man, and then we get to this book. And yeah, I mean, Love and Obstacles, love that collection. And the zombie novel is great. But this book feels like something you've been working to for a really long time. And then you tell me you signed the contract in 2010. And if anyone has read The Aquarium, 
we know what happened in 2010. It's it's included in the book of my lives and I cannot recommend it enough. I will tell you, I went back to it just as we were sitting down to tape and I had to stop reading because I know how the story ends. I know what happens. And I couldn't go there right before sitting down with you. Yeah, so, and again, I know I sound like I'm talking in circles, but really, <laughs> if you haven't read the aquarium, just go read that piece. Um, and it will explain why I had a moment at the top of the show where I was like, huh, okay, now I need to rethink my approach <laughs> to the new novel. But Sasha, I always love talking to you. I really do. Oh, I mean, we get to go in really weird directions and talk about stuff that other people are probably going, why are they talking about this? But really, it all comes down to love. It yeah. really just comes down to love. And if you don't have the love, then why are we here? Yeah. I mean, seriously. <laughs> I am a romantic, um, but also it's born of experience because you can lose property and countries and this and that. What you miss and what you need and what sustains you is other people and other people yeah. you love, not yeah. you know, not your bosses or underlings. It's people you love that keep you in the world. And it's like contact. Who do not want to be in the world, they feel unloved. And so I mean it's the failure of the world. In some ways, but that's what sustains us. I don't care if it sounds romantic. I'm not. I'm not sappy, but I think it, I. One of the things about this book is I learned things about myself and yeah. others while writing it, which is why I do doing what I do. I don't want to know things and then present them to others and lecture them. I want to find ways to discover things about the world, people, and myself in doing it. And then residues of that are all over the book. And another thing about this book. Mm -hmm. I thank you for not mentioning it. It is the one that is not autobiographical. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. But I thought you were tired of talking about the autobiography. I'm just focusing on the art that came out of the autobiography. No, no, it's, I'm, I said I'm glad you didn't mention it because it doesn't matter. <laughs> but it's, it also, it is, it's, it's, in some ways, I had to graduate to that level because yeah. I'm talking about myself, I suppose. But also, I could, I, there's a continuity. Yeah, completely. Yeah, Without so a doubt. Autobiographical and uh, entirely non-autobiographical. Which is why I'm curious to see what comes next. Because I think you I think you unlocked a door here and you're going to walk. I, I suspect something new is coming. And I love the idea that you're always looking for the form of the thing as you're writing. And I think that's really important. I think the idea that the form will let you know what it needs to be is for an entirely other conversation. And I should also mention too, I should have mentioned at the top of the show, you're also a poet, but that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have enough time to list all the things that I do. Ah, I know, but it's really oh, cool. It's really cool and your students are really lucky and there's a reason you got that MacArthur Genius Grant. So at this point, I'm gonna say thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sasha. Thank you. And we'll see that's you soon. Fun. Ciao, yeah. Hello readers, it's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of The World and All That It Holds. I'm Mark, I'm coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, and I'm joined by my book buddy, Jamie. Hello, Jamie. Hi, Mark. I'm Jamie. I'm coming from my Barnes & Noble in Leawood, Kansas. Fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in if that's all right. I've got a great book to talk about. This is a book that I have held close to my heart for a long time. Um, it is The Passion by Jeanette Winterson. Uh, I love her writing very much, uh, but this is probably my favorite, and I feel like it ties in really nicely with the world and all that it holds. This is a beautiful story about a man who serves Napoleon under his infamous reign and a woman who serves her heart in the waterways of Venice. Uh, their paths connect to create this wonderful and tragic fairy tale. And the book alternates between the two narrators and protagonists. So you've got Henri, who is a semi-chef serving under Napoleon uh, and makes his way to Venice where he runs into Vianelle, who is a gambler, a web-toed, red-headed, just mysterious character who has just oodles of passion uh, to give to herself and to others. This book just builds up this massive epic, but is only told in, the, um, I think, maybe 200 pages. Uh, but this world is so lived in and so realized and lovely that you just feel like you're spending months and months with these folks. 
It challenges notions of faith and, of course, passion, hence the title. Um, anywhere from the religious fervor of Napoleon's followers to a secret love affair that just is struggling and trying so hard to stay solid and coherent. The characters feel true. The world world is fully built. Uh, and the droplets of magical realism that uh, you encounter in this book just feel very earned. I love this book. I think it's a wonder. And that is Passion by Jeanette Winterson. Jamie, what do you have for us? Uh, well, you might have just moved that one to the top of my list. <laughs> oh, it's, it's wonderful. It's a great quick read. It just is. It's a it's a stunner. I love it so much. That's awesome. All right. OK, uh, well, I'm going to talk about a sort of epistolary literary science fiction novel, believe it or not. I'm going to make my case. Uh, it's comprised of letters back and forth between uh, two agents of a never ending time war. Uh, known only to us as Red and Blue. And this is How You Lose the Time War by Amal El Motar and Max Gladstone. These two agents kind of catch glimpses of each other all across time uh, through this story. And their relationship changes over time from one of kind of professional adversarial uh, sort of messages to these really forbidden romantic communiques. And uh, the story ends up turning into a really lovely romance. So even though it's not literary fiction, and you know I love crossovers, I do think there is um, quite a lot here for a person who hasn't read science fiction before, because it really dispenses with a lot of the time-consuming, world-building, and science-y background kind of stuff. It basically just says, hey, guys, there's a time war going on. Uh, the, I think the authors describe time as a sort of braid, and these two characters are moving along the strands, and they kind of keep crossing each other's paths. It's interesting, too, that with the two authors, they actually wrote, each wrote one character. Uh, so Max Gladstone wrote Red's Letters, and uh, El Matar wrote uh, Blue's Letters. Both these stories are uh, epic in terms of time and scope and expressions of romantic love, just like Pinto and Osmond's story. Um, there's chaos everywhere, but these are two lovely characters, and they have these almost poetic, really lush dreamy confessions that reminded me a little bit of Pinto's sort of stream of consciousness during his sort of opium-induced um, moments in Heeman's book. It's fanciful, it's beautiful, it's epic, sapphic, time-traveling love story. I hope you'll pick it up. Fantastic pick. I love that book so much. And I feel like that can also live in the same bookshelf as The Passion by Winterson and uh, with Heeman's book as far as something that just finding those beacons of love and light amidst a, a chaotic time um and told beautifully i think yes a uh, fantastic pick not surprised yeah. at all i love that book so much <laughs> oh, One of well, yes so much so uh well that is all we have for today thanks so much for tuning into poured over please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode you can also follow us at barnes and noble I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Jamie. You can follow my home store at BN Leewood KS. Thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in. Happy reading. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.